So the second phase is after we kind of found who we were looking for as far as credible sightings and reports, I came from that background in law enforcement where we use some of the best forensic artists in the world. And these are guys that are trained by the FBI, and it's like they have a sixth sense that I don't understand. But they could sit down with a witness who observed a suspect say to bank, rob the bank. They could sit down with them, and an hour later, they'll have a sketch. And it was, if the, once they catch the guy, it's like the guy was in the room when the guy drew the sketch. That's how accurate these are. They are bone, stone cold accurate. And we looked for the best guy in North America. That was Harvey Pratt. Harvey uh, actually used to be the head of the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation. He's now the forensic artist for the state has 45 years of law enforcement experience now, and he is a Native American chief, and wasn't that lucky? Because every Native American reservation we brought him into, he had instant credibility, he spoke their language, understood their rituals, their culture, it was just phenomenal. So all of the uh, forensic sketches in Hoopa, in the Hoopa Project and in Tribal Bigfoot were done by Harvey. So the first day, I had lined up six witnesses to meet with Harvey that had direct sighting somewhere as close as 10 feet. So for people that don't know the Bigfoot world, there's two factions. Going back 60 years, up until six years ago, there was a faction uh, that believed this biped was an ape. And the new faction, when we came in, believe it's human-based. And how these guys who wrote all these books that have ape and North American ape in them came to that logic, I have no idea. And I'm not belittling them, but I truly don't understand it. Because they, most of them came from Canada and the Northwest where it's, there's a strong Native American and First Nations presence. And all you have to do is to walk into any First Nations tribe in Canada, any Native American tribe in the United States, and talk to them, talk to them intelligently and respectfully, and they will tell you that it's another tribe of humans. Not one tribe I ever met said that they're animals. So why these guys never talk or gave the Native Americans or the First Nations people in Canada credit, I have no idea. But when we started to come in with the sketches at the end of the first day, we sat around looking at each other absolutely floored because there was a profound human look to these. There was no ape look to them. And in some instances, certain Native Americans would say, if you talk to them in our language, they understand. And the elders would pass that down. So the result of those uh, two years up there was the Hoopa Project. And I, I don't believe there is room for common ground on this because, no, and I, you can quote me on this, nowhere in North America has there ever been ape hair found in the wild. There's never been ape bones found in the wild. And there's no tribe in the US or Canada that thinks they're apes. So I have a difficult time with that assessment. And we all did, everyone in our group. And we were ostracized by a large portion of the Bigfoot community because of those beliefs. And I think it was taking money out of their pockets because no one was reading books about apes. They started to read books about people, hairy people. So after we were done with the Hoopa Project, the criticism, if there was some, was that, well, okay, that's the way they look in Hoopa. But what are they like in the rest of the world? You know, you, you got some little confined area, and these people have their squandered beliefs all messed up. Well, what do they look in the rest of the U.S.? Well, we were going there anyhow, and we were well on our way. And we started to march across the U.S. and started to meet with other reservations and other Native Americans and other people that just happened to have the same experiences. That ended up being tribal Bigfoot. And at about that time, we started to have the ability to collect DNA. So there's a couple big Bigfoot groups out here in the US that pound their chest and scream in the woods and howl and yell. And they had a, they had a supporter for eight years that asked them to go get Bigfoot DNA. They didn't get any. 
They never got any. And quietly, we were collecting it. And we didn't say anything. We just kind of kept our mouths shut and our ears open. And we went on to uh, try to find a genetic expert to categorize the DNA. Now, there had been about 15 samples of DNA that was collected in the previous, say, 15 years and had gone to various labs. Every one of those results came back as human-based. And everybody in the Bigfoot community said it was contamination. So put that little feather in your hat and think about it. So what we had to do is we had to find this genetics expert to really take this and run with it. So first thing we did is we called a number of universities and asked to get them involved. Not one university wanted to touch the topic. They all said it was a hoax, it wasn't believable, they don't exist, we don't want to get involved. Not one. So then we started to go down the path of finding a private scientist that would work for us. And we interviewed probably four or five. We ended up with Dr. Ketchum. And you may say, well, of those 15 samples that came back as human, there were some big problems with that in that they couldn't get down to the nuclear level to really find what the genetic base was on those. And the reason being is that there are some hoops you have to jump through with Bigfoot DNA that's like no other DNA in the world. And it really took Dr. Ketchum two, two and a half years to figure it out. It was not easy. And if not for her persistence, the project never would have come to fruition. So uh, one thing in tribal Bigfoot that uh, Harvey did, Harvey Pratt, is that picture on the bottom right is an artist's rendering of the Bigfoot in the Patterson-Gimlin film. It's a very good picture. Well, one of the things Harvey does is when somebody walks into a bank to rob a bank and they have a beard on and long hair, Harvey has the ability to take the beard off so you can see what kind of face it is. So I'm not going to show you the face here, but I will tell you that when he took the facial hair off, it looked just like a Native American. And that picture is in Tribal Bigfoot. So once you start to do research on any topic, if you think you're the, the smartest person in the lot, you're going to fail. Well, I understand what I don't know, and there's a lot. But there was a researcher named Ray, Ray Crow, and Ray is still around. He, was, uh, he owned a Bigfoot group in Oregon. And uh, part of the, that first three months we did is we read every book you could find out there, probably over 120 about Bigfoot. All the researchers read them. And Ray had a, uh, something called the track record. And it involved a monthly newsletter that went out for 17 years. It had some of the best information in it of anything anywhere. And Ray was retiring, and we went in and we bought his entire collection of research that went over 25 years. And that really helped us understand a lot of the mechanics and things. One thing that Ray wrote about that you will be interested in is there's a Native American reservation in Washington in Colville. And they had certain lights that appeared in the mountains around their reservation continuously for years. Also, just as a happenstance, it's probably one of the hottest and still is Bigfoot sites in the world. And Ray would never come out and say, oh, A equals B equals C. But if you were smart enough to kind of read his track record, you could kind of understand that there were similarities and there were lines together that kind of put the Bigfoot in the same location as the lights. And it was very interesting. So what we did is we put the track record, we got a grad student put the track record on a CD. It's 3,000 pages long, a 70-page index, and for anyone who is interested in research on Bigfoot and UFOs, that thing is phenomenal. It's online, you can buy it through our store. Just what I said to you about uh, Bigfoot hair coming back, this was an article written in the uh, mid-80s talking about hair. I know there's some uh, Native Americans here from the Thule River Reservation. I got permission from the tribal chairman to go in. And they have a uh, kind of a cave, big rock location. 
and they had University of California archaeologists come in and date these pictographs at 1,500 to 2,000 years. And it, it befuddles me that you could think that those were anything other than a Bigfoot. different pictures of them inside the reservation uh, in this area of the rock that are a little better than this. We have all the pictures online at our website and you can, you can kind of get a better pick for them. But some of the elders we talked to on the sites were very informative, very interesting. Again, if you're not respectful and you're not willing to really learn, you're not going to get access to these things. And so we, we did learn. Now, when you're doing research on a topic, it's not always important what's happening today, but you'll save yourself a lot of time if you go back and you study history. That's why we study history in school. So we don't make the same mistakes like our government doesn't make, right? But the truth of the matter is, is that we spent a lot of time going back through the archives of a lot of newspapers that nobody ever looked at. And I can guarantee you for a fact You've never seen what I'm going to show you tonight unless you've read my books. What happened was is that in 1924, there's a group of hikers out, and they get approached by some tall, hairy Bigfoots, and they get rocks thrown at them. They don't get hurt. They kind of just get harassed out of the area. And they go tell the local sheriff, and there was a group of people that saw it. Sheriff believes something's up, so the sheriff's putting together a posse to go out and hunt these things and kill them. Now what happened is, is that three Native American tribes got together and they held a press conference. That's what this article is about. And I have to tell you, if you think back to 1924, the Native Americans probably weren't held in the highest of esteem and held to the highest level of credibility. And I don't know why, but they just weren't. So for these three tribes to come together and hold a press conference and say, and that's what this article says. It's in the book. It says, this is a tribe of people. Don't go out and hunt them. They have their own language. They have certain abilities you and I don't have. They're much stronger and much faster than you and I. And if you get them really mad, they could hurt you very bad. And they went on and they talked about the abilities to mimic animals in the woods, like owls and coyotes and things. Now, if you have a belief system that these things are apes and you're a researcher, you're never going to pull this one out. And it's not just this one. We have many of these that go back 50, 60, 70, 80 years. And I, I think this is pretty strong evidence that they're not apes, especially when you start to think about the language part of it. Now, there's a portion of our website that is all about Bigfoot language. And one of the smartest guys I've ever met is a guy named Scott Nelson. And Scott uh, was a crypto-linguist specialist for the Department of the Navy. He's one of these guys that sat in a room in Florida, and he listens to secret conversations going on between the Russians and Cuba and the U.S. And I mean, some of his stories are just great. Well. He just happened to get involved in the Bigfoot world because he heard that there were some tapes out there that said that this was Bigfoot language. And he spent almost a year breaking it down to a series of verbs, adverbs, nouns, pronouns. And he goes, that's a language. And that, that pretty much turns the corner from animal to human. 